praise the Lord. Such an honor to be back here. Great to see a lot of the youth. My, what an awesome time at retreat this year. And I have a feeling it'll never be the same. Uh, I, I won't be. It's just a privilege to be there. An honor to the, the Stephen, Sister Emily, all those that were involved with your pastor. I'm telling you, so blessed. And it's, uh, it's a privilege to be here. I love what I feel every time I'm here. I love when the presence of God moves. If the presence of God is not going to move, then uh, we've missed it somewhere along the way. Because church is not somewhere you come. It's not a social club. It's not a social get. There's a lot of places we can go if we didn't, just didn't have anything to do tonight. There's a lot of things, you know, could have got some more clothes washed, could have studied up, could have got ready for work, could have got a better night's rest. If it was just to come and spend some time, that doesn't do it. The reason we come is because there's a longing in our soul, because we are doing the best we can. We're looking for answers. We're looking for a closer walk with Him. We're going through things. And we walk in here not with an expectation that I'm going to hear just a story. I'm going to say hello to some friends, and I'm going to walk out. If that's the, that's the mindset, it's so easy to walk out with what God intended you to leave with. And uh, the, the mindset is to come expecting and believing that something is going to happen, that God is going to open my mind, open my heart, and that I'm going to receive something from the Word of God. I don't want to... Uh I don't want to be like the, so many of them that sat at the feet of Jesus and they received a miracle and they, they got the bread, they got the fish, and then they walked and they left and they were hungry 12 hours later. I want something that, I mean, it stirs within me on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I don't want something that five hours from now it's already gone away. God, I want you to do something in my life that it will transform me forever. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to go to Hebrews chapter 6, starting at verse 18. Read two very quick scriptures. We'll try to get into get into this. Hebrews chapter six, verse eighteen says that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Basically what he's saying is those that were in need of a refuge can lay hold on a hope, and we have a hope. He says, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. I wonder if we could pray right now. Listen, I, I've been doing this long enough to know that I can get hung up on what I want to do and I can mess everything up. But I've also done this long enough to know that if I can get me out of the way and you can get you out of the way and we can say, God, whatever it is you want to do in my life, I'm open to that. You have to be open. You have to be open. You, you can't get anything from anybody. You ever try to accept a gift with a closed hand? It just doesn't happen. You know, opening yourself up. Yeah, well, what if it hurts? What if it, yeah, what if it doesn't? You know, yes, if I, when I open myself up to God, he takes some things out, but, it's, but he also puts things back. He, he gives me joy unspeakable, which is full of glory. He gives me peace, which is past all understanding. There's so much that God can do when I allow myself to be open and say, God, would you open my heart and my, my mind? Would you allow me to receive whatever you have for me? Can we do that right now? Lord, we come here not, not, not for our own, God, just to be here, just to say we were here. But, Lord, we came that we may hear from you, that we may feel your presence, hear your voice. You know every need and situation that is represented here. Lord Jesus. Jesus, I ask that you would have your way in each and every heart and mind and soul, that we would leave here changed by the power of your glory and your mercy. I ask that you would do whatever it is you're wanting to do in each and every one of our lives, and we thank you for it. We will be careful to give you all the praise and the honor and glory to your name, Jesus. Amen. And everybody said amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. An anchor is a... Uh, an anchor is an awesome thing. The Bible says we have an anchor. Well, it says, no, which hope we have is an anchor. Well, what is that hope? The Bible says Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is our hope. And by this scripture, he says he is the anchor of our soul. We have an anchor. It's a very important thing. If you've never been in a boat, you don't truly realize the importance of an anchor. But if you get in one, the value of it becomes important very, very quickly. We... Um, where I live is right on the uh, edge of the Gulf of Mexico. We are literally, uh, if I walked out of my father's church and took a right turn, uh, after five miles, I'd better be in a boat because there's no more land. And so we, we'd go out there, and 
not knowing just a whole lot about boats as far, you know, we go in the rivers, the lakes, and all that, but not very familiar with anything past that atmosphere. But we had got a, uh, we had, purchased a boat my brother and I we were very excited and we went to look at it and boy we were checking out all the features boy good motor I mean it's a nice size boat this is really nice and we started looking and boy I mean we got just I mean it, it was amazing we didn't get one anchor we didn't get two anchors the boat came with three anchors I thought my goodness we can go anywhere we want we go all the way out into the middle of the ocean we have three anchors every boat I've ever seen only has one we are a triple threat we have three anchors nothing is going to move us and boy I told my friend I said hey do you know where we can catch some of the bigger fish he said oh man there's a place you can go out right on the edge of the gulf I mean the water's a little rocky I mean he said a little rough he said and the current's pretty strong I said but I've got three anchors we can go wherever we want to go. You just point me in the right direction. And so, but we got out there, and we got out to where he said was a good place where they'd been able to catch some rather large-sized fish, and bull reds is what they are. It's a big red fish. He said, oh, this is good. So we got out there, and no, you know, one anchor is really all you need. No sense in getting the others wet. So I just threw out one anchor. I thought that will be good. A little while later, I barely turned around. He said, you have a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, look. Boy, we were pulling that anchor. I mean, we were just moving. It didn't work. I said, hey, it's all right. Put your mind at ease. There's more where that came from. I went to the back of the boat, and I threw out the other two anchors. I just, you know, I didn't have to. I figured, you know, we'll just go ahead and make sure we don't go anywhere. So I've got three anchors in the water. We got our lines. We, we Boy, we cast it out there, and we barely set our poles down. And he said, this ain't working. I looked up. Every line we had plus the ropes that were attached to the anchors were all going that way, and we were still passing up shoreline. I got a broken anchor. It doesn't work. I can't believe this. Boy, I was so frustrated. I started pulling the anchors up. I mean, I, I don't know who put, who put these here. I don't know who bought them. I, I, don't, I don't know how a anchor becomes, you know, dysfunctional. I, I, don't know, I don't know exactly what's causing it not to work, but we're going to check it out. So, well, we loaded up. And there wasn't no sense in fishing there. We couldn't stay anywhere. And so we got on the boat. I went by a marine shop, and I went in. I said, hey, we got a problem. He said, well, I said, well, am I not throwing them in the right place? Do I need to put them a certain way? He said, well, what's the problem? I said, my anchors don't work. They're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. He said, well, let me look at them. So he came out and he looked at them. He said, oh, no. He said, the anchor's fine. You just don't have the right kind. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, these are just perfectly fine if you're out in the middle of a lake or if you're over here in one of the canals. He said, but you're out there on the edge of the gulf. He said, man, those are entirely different currents. He said, those are strong currents. These things don't have anything that grab anywhere. He said, These, you're just pulling them along. You're just a dead weight. He said, you've got to have something that will get a grip in that earth and that it will hold you. He said, you just don't have the right kind. I've never met anybody that didn't have some type or most, haven't hardly met anybody that didn't have some type of a walk with God or an understanding of God. The problem is a lot of times if I'm not careful, I can become comfortable with the fact that I have a knowledge of God or a walk with God and fail to realize the strength of how, what kind of walk with God I have. Some people have a walk with God that does great when the bills are all paid and nobody's lost their job and nobody's sick and the car starts on the first time and man, the, the house is warm, it's supposed to be warm, There's the rain doesn't come. Oh man, they, they can run the aisles, they can worship, they can pray, they've got a great kind of, but you let something upset their day let the dog bite them in the morning let the kids go to back talking let the car quit starting because of your beloved snow and all these things and some of us boy that walk with God all of a sudden it ain't enough to hold us anymore and we start drifting off into places we wish we never would have gone we start talking a little different we act a little different our attitude changes our demeanor changes why because we had a walk with God that works fine when there are no problems, but not, not a prayer life that's deep enough to anchor me when the, when the doctor gives me a bad report and not a, not a walk with God that's faithful enough that it keeps me when there's a thousand things going wrong in my life. Not just any kind of walk with God will do. I don't need just anything. I want to walk with God in a prayer life that is strong enough. I want to know him good enough that when I'm in the middle of my darkest trial, it still doesn't shake my faith in him. I don't want, what happens is, and I'm not saying, well, you, man, you're saying I do this. No, I'm saying I've done this. 
I'm saying I've had to get to some places where I had to develop a stronger walk with God because there were some trials I went through that I started questioning just who God was. Is he real? Is he this? Is he that? Oh, well, I don't know if God, and kind of find out God is everything he said he was. But my knowledge of him and my walk with him were not enough to the point where I could believe him no matter what I was going through. You, get, you really get enough of a knowledge of God, and it doesn't matter what trial comes. The Bible says that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they get thrown into the fiery furnace. What happens in the fiery furnace? The Bible says they get a revelation. The king comes and says, I thought we only throw in three, but I see four, and the fourth is as the son of God. It's only sometimes in our worst trials that we get revelations of exactly who God is. I can't get a revelation of him being a healer unless I've been somewhere where I'm sick. I can't get a revelation sometimes of what he can do until I get to a place where I don't know what to do. So we want a revelation of who God is, but unfortunately sometimes that means putting us in a place we don't necessarily want to be. But if you'll notice, the Bible says the fire of the, the fire furnace was so hot that when they were thrown in, the guards were killed by the heat. Well, I got a question. The Bible says that the king came in and he's looking at them walking around in the fire. Why are they still walking around in the fire if the guards that are making them stay in there are dead? Why? Because I'd better be in the fire with him than out of the fire without him. I'd rather go through the trials in my life knowing he's by my side than to live without all the trials and not know him. I, yeah, I don't like everything I'm dealing with, but I wouldn't try, but as long as I know him, I'm willing to go wherever he wants. I wouldn't take another lifestyle where I didn't know him in any way. And here's what's amazing. By the time God brings you through the trial you're in, it's not going to destroy you. The only thing that was destroyed in the fiery furnace were the very things that were holding them back to begin with. And if you allow God to take you to a place in prayer, and if we get to a place of faithfulness and our walk with God gets to a place where we're willing to say, God, it doesn't matter what comes my way, I'm not leaving. It's not in the dictionary, but there's an amazing word that will change our lives. It's called stick to I don't know who made it, but they ought to put it in there. It's amazing what God can do when we just decide to stick with him no matter what comes. Well, well, well I lost my job, but that, don't worry, God. That don't affect me and you. It may affect some things, but it doesn't affect my praise. It doesn't affect my worship. It doesn't affect my relationship. Oh, man, I got a bad report from the doctor, and I don't like it. But don't worry, God. It don't affect me. It don't affect my worship. There's some things it just doesn't affect. And we just make up in our mind, I'm going to be faithful no matter what. The problem is in life, there's a lot of, it's not just on the water where people have different kinds of anchors. In life, there's a lot of things we attach ourselves to confident that it will be what holds us. If I could only get that job, it wouldn't matter what happened. If I could get that job, I'd get all the respect, the self-worth, the recognition. If I could get that, I could find who I am. That would mean everything to me. Oh, if I had that car. I, now, I remember that. Boy, if I had that, my problems would be over. Daddy, I work a 1,000 hours a day if you just help me get that car. I mean, you, you start thinking outside the box. I got, I, I'll tell you, I'll give you every dime from now till I'm 50 if you'll just give me that car. I told so, uh, <laughs> Brother Betcher and Robbie, I were driving the other day, and there's a Maserati going down the street in Geneva. I said, I don't know why I should get that car. In three weeks, it'll smell like McDonald's fries and chicken nuggets from the kids, and it just don't make any sense. It won't have that new car smell for one week. It'll, they'll be like, this is what kind of car? But we do that. We find things to attach our, oh, that's the house. That's the dream house. That's the last one I, no, it won't be. There will be another one. Oh, what about this? Oh, that's the perfect girl. That's the perfect. Oh, my goodness. All you young guys, yeah, look at look at your eyes light up. It's like just, it's like a, like a, just a daze went over them. I mean, oh, it, it, Mr. Wright, Mr. Mrs. Wright, what? Um, oh, if I had that, I'd, be, well, I'd live in a tent. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she'll be all right if you put that tent right in the middle of an eight-bedroom, seven-bath house, and she'll be fine with it. Oh, if I had that guy, nothing else. Oh. But you know what I've seen? I've seen people who got the perfect job, 
and got the perfect spouse and got the perfect situation and perfect according to their terms. They got what makes it. I mean, they got the best. That's what, oh, that's what I need. And yet I've seen people that have got it only to find themselves miserable, lacking and falling apart. I've seen Mr. Wright and Mrs. Wright get together and go through so many wrongs, you never recognize that family by the time it was all done. Those poor kids didn't have a chance. I've seen that person get the best job, and by the time it was over, they hated that job, hated their life. I've seen, what are you talking about? I'm telling you, when you tie yourselves to things in this world, you cannot be surprised when happiness and peace just doesn't show up there's only one thing that I can anchor myself to that is going to deliver here's the other side of that I've seen Mr. Wrong marry Mrs. Wrong and get to an altar and God make all the wrong right and all of a sudden people are like whoa, whoa, whoa. how did you get to where you are I can't explain it I don't know how to tell you all I know is the closer I got to him the closer we got to each other and I don't I, I can't explain it I've seen people I, I, I have a testimony I was telling the you of two people eating out of garbages underneath the overpasses, didn't even have a career, didn't have anything. I mean, they were just arguing over which corner somebody was going to try to get money from on which day. And then give their life to God, get a job. They got a job at the same company. See God lift them up to where both of them on their own making well over 100000 a year, running the company. Boy, two of the greatest saints you could ever see. And they'll be the first to tell you, when I gave my life to God, he just began to, I, can't, I don't even have a GED. And God just keeps on blessing me. What are you saying? I'm saying we have an anchor. And if we will attach ourselves to it, it has the power to change everything in our life. But that doesn't make sense. Why? Well, because if we have an anchor that is so readily available, then how many, so many lives are falling apart? I, I love what you're saying up there, preacher. That's a real pretty story. Unfortunately, my life is nothing like what you're talking about. And if this anchor that we have, this hope we have, is all that you say he is, then try to explain my life. How come I am getting tossed in the wind? How come my life is shattered and torn to pieces? If this anchor that you say I can hold on to, if this hope that you say will change my life is truly real, then what's the problem? Had a buddy a while back, different place. They were going fishing. There's, there's a place there called the Livingston, Lake Livingston. And uh, what a lot of the guys do is they'll go up to the Livingston Dam because when that, when that dam opens and that water starts rushing out, it is the best place to fish. When all the bait come in, boy, those white bass just go crazy. They go into a feeding frenzy right there. I mean, really, they will limit out. They can just, I mean, it is amazing what they do. And one gentleman, he was out there, a friend of mine, he got in his boat, and he was so excited because he had an anchor. And I don't mean... Some anchor. I mean, he had the anchor. I mean, if you go into the store and say, hey, give me something that will hold a house. I mean, he had, I mean, the boat's probably two of these, but he had an anchor probably half the size. I mean, he was excited about it. He said, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get right there in the middle of the river. Everybody else is over on the side, but I'm going to get right in the middle, and I'm going to put this anchor out, and that way I'm going to be able to fish where nobody else is able to fish. He got out there. Boy, you could see him getting that anchor. <laughs> Boom. I mean, I mean, he's dumping that anchor over the water. And, boy, they're getting ready, and they're getting their poles all set up. Every now and then, all of a sudden, he looks up. They are down the river, and they are moving. They got the worst place there is. Everybody else is closer to where they need to be than them. Boy, he's frustrated. I mean, he is just, he's like, I can't believe this thing. It's not working like it's supposed to. Boy, he gets all the way up there. I ain't even got to finish this story. See? What do you think is at the end of that rope? A loose knot. That anchor. What about the anchor? The anchor did everything it was supposed to do. The question is who tied the knot? The question, we love to sing the song, the anchor holds 
though the ship is battered. The anchor holds, though the sails are torn. The problem is not the anchor. The anchor always has been and always will be what he said he will be, and he will always do what he said he will do. The problem is not does the anchor hold. The question is who holds the anchor? Because as long as I've got free will, I decide how closely I am wrapped up in him. It can be a little bit or it can be a lot. doesn't matter. Oh, I got the best anchor in the world. It doesn't matter if you don't know how to attach yourself to that which you are putting your hope in. You can't tie just any kind of knot. you got to be careful. If the anchor is valuable, but the only value the anchor is to you is if you are connected to it. You know, I tell you what, I'll just lose this so I won't single anybody out. That's all right. This is how some of us are. Boy, I love my walk with God. I'm going to tell you, it's, man, I love what Brother Betcher's been preaching. I love this church. Man, I've got such a strong, man, I finally got an anchor in my life. It's going to make such a difference. I'm gonna, I mean, it's going to change. Change my world. Well, it's not changing much that way. Hold on. My life's never going to be the same. I went to church on Sunday. Boy, I got everything. Man, look, look at that. Uh-oh. Actually tied it too good. <laughs> we don't usually tie them. We tie them about like that. Then we get shocked. You see, I want to just hold on to that just a little for me. I, I, I want to hold on to the anchor. But, but I don't want it so tight that I still can't get to the places I used to be every now and then. Oh, I, I, want to, I want to wrap myself around the anchor, but not so much I can't still go back to some of the places I used to go. I want an anchor in my life, but I don't want one that's too restricting on me because I haven't really gotten tired of going everywhere I used to go and doing everything I used to do. I want to walk with God, but I don't want one that makes me change too much. And then we wonder, well, how in the world, how, why am I right back in the same situation I used to? Because there's not anything holding me to the The anchor only works if I'm willing to say, hey, not every place I want to go is a place I need to go. Not everything I want in my life is something I need in my life. Not every decision I want to make is something I need to do. And sometimes you got to say, hey, you know what? I trust him enough to know if he doesn't let me go that far, then I don't need to be that far. look a little ridiculous that's all right I'd look a lot more ridiculous if I went back to the places I used to be my praise may look ridiculous but you should have seen me before I got a hold of Jesus oh I know my sacrifice and the way I dress may look funny you should have seen how I used to be oh you think the way I worship looks weird you should have seen some of the things I used to do you think I'm crazy now you should have seen me before Jesus got a hold of me How do you tie a knot? I'll tell you how I tie it. You tie it in prayer. You tie it in faithfulness. You tie it in repentance. You tie it staying faithful when you don't feel it. Why are you showing up for church like that? Because I got to make sure the, night, the knot is tied. Why do you keep going to every service? Don't you, don't you have something to do tonight? No, no. I got to be there. Why? Because I got to keep tying the knot. Why? Because I cannot go back to where I came from. Come here, brother. Come here. Boy, what are you doing? Oh, I don't just need a church. I need a man of God. You don't understand. I need somebody that will tell me when I'm wrong, tell me when I'm stepping too far. I can't always see things from my point of view. I need a man of God that's willing to say, hey, you're not going to like this, but you need to make some changes. I need the church, but I need the man of God. I need a walk with God. I better tie it around prayer. If I, you got kids? Come here, Brother Stephen. Hurry, hurry, run, run, run. Who's over Sunday school? Get here quick. Come here, brother. What are you doing? You don't understand. I got kids. Oh, I want them to be successful in high school and all that. But you know what I want more than anything? I want them to make it to heaven. Brother Stephen, whatever you do, I want my kids involved. Come on, hurry, hurry. We're running out of time. What are you doing? It's just Sunday school. Oh, no, this ain't Sunday school. This is where they learn about what we believe. This is where they learn about what a walk with God does. I don't... 
What are you saying? I'm telling you, if you get yourself wrapped up in the church and wrapped up in your pastor, wrapped up in doing something in the youth, if the more I attach myself to the things of God, <laughs> devil, you want to move my kids? <laughs> You got to move him, 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 the church, and on top of all that, you got to move God Almighty. You can take that off. I want to be so tied up in a walk with God that the devil has to move God himself to move my family. But it's my decision. Everything. Every anchor. Well, well, what about salvation? Salvation is free. Yes, it is. But every gift I've ever given somebody had to be unwrapped. It's free. Yes, it is. But there are steps to getting it. It's yours. It, you, you don't have to go ask anybody's permission. I can have it. Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for their mission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What, what are you talking about? I'm saying if I do this, it's there. But it's my decision whether to take that. And I'm trying to hurry. Musicians, you can get ready. But let me tell you something. The day I got the Holy Ghost wasn't the day I just got saved. I don't know about you, but Paul said, I die daily. I don't know about you, but I don't wake up in the morning. And if, you know what? I can't, even, I can't even eat breakfast. There's a strong desire to find somewhere and pray for 13 hours. I don't know about you. You can tell by looking at me. I don't wake up in the morning and every thought that goes through says, why don't you fast for 30 days this month? <laughs> Maybe you walk up and go walking on water at 3 in the morning before you take your morning flight around the city. I wake up and the second I'm up, I fight flesh and I fight it all day and I fight this temptation. I fight that attitude and I fight it over here and then I come into the house of God and I say, flesh, you don't feel like it, but you have to worship. You're not going to like it, but you have to pray. After Peter says these things, let me tell you something. I, I've been married for a little bit. I'm going to get myself in trouble. I just know it. I don't know how you came to have a walk with God or how you got married. I, I was in love with my wife when I was 16 years old, but she didn't want nothing to do with this guy. And looking back, I can blame her because if my daughter ever falls for some guy like me back then, <laughs> don't pray for me pray for him <laughs> pray for me too <laughs> I don't like prison <laughs> I couldn't get her attention to save my life way down the road about 24 years uh about 24 years old, she came to a church thing we ended up meeting getting this anyway she she left her Bible at our church I know spiritual and she called. She said, hey, could you bring me my Bible? I said, no, you can't get this Bible. I said, you can get it one way. She's like, how am I going to get it? I said, you can go out to eat with me, and I'll give you your Bible. Otherwise, I'm giving it to somebody. She said, oh, okay, well, we're, on Friday night, let's go eat. I was like, okay, that's fine. That's done. Well, I went, and I looked through the pews where she told me she left it, and I found the Bible. It said her name on it. But there could have been a lot of people by her name, so I had to be extra careful. I had to open it up. When I did, I don't know at what point in her life she did this, but there was a page, and on it, front and back, she had listed everything she wanted in a husband. When I say it was over 80 things, I kid you not, it was every bit of it. I started looking at that, and I came to a revelation very quickly. <laughs> she may be looking for a husband, but she ain't looking for me. <laughs> I mean, it was detailed. Has to have nice hands, nice eyes, sweet smile. Has to like old people. Has to like babies. Has to like middle people. Has to love my parents. Mama must lie. I was like, this, this, this is crazy. <laughs> but I was in love. <laughs> I finally had my chance. Now, you can say whatever you want to say. I don't care. I got the girl, and it's all fair in love and war. I made a copy. <laughs> you laugh all you want, <laughs> but she's sitting right over there. <laughs> and my name is at the end of her name. 
What are you saying? I'm saying I took one look at it and realized I can't be all that this is. <laughs> but now I got something to go by. I can be nice to some people I'm not nice to. I can make her mama. I'll be the best thing her mama's ever met in her life. She's going to love me, and she does. I'm going to smile at everybody. I'm going to hold every baby I ever walk across. I tell you, what do you say? I'm telling you, I fell in love with somebody, and all of a sudden, I was willing to alter who I was to get the attention of the one that I was in love with. I took one look at the word and I realized <laughs> the place that he's preparing for those that are ready is not a place that I'm ready for. He said, but that's all right. Look, these are the things that you can do to become who I called you to be. And he even left me a book that lets me know exactly what to do to get to that place. If I love him. Why do you live that way? Who makes you? Nobody makes me do this. I'm after someone's affection. I'm after his attention. I'm after his approval. Oh, you trying to stand out? Yes, I am. He said, come out from among them and be ye separate and I will receive you. Yes, I'm doing it, but not for you. You are you. I want him to know, hey, here I am and I'm looking for you. So then what prevents us from making that connection we have an anchor it's stronger than any cancer it's stronger than any sin it's stronger than guilt it's stronger than condemnation there is a walk with God and salvation that is unlike anything else it's enough to save the very worst person that has ever lived and I have the opportunity to get a hold of him then what prevents us The worst thing I think we ever learned in the Garden of Eden was not how to sin. The Bible says, and he heard thy voice in the garden, and he said, I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Were it just sin, I believe God could have dealt with some things right then and right there. But probably one of the worst things we ever learned in the Garden of Eden was how to blame somebody else. Oh, look what you did. Oh, no, no, no. You don't know where I came from. It's not my fault. Oh, you don't know You know what she did. You don't know what he did. You don't know what I've been through. Oh, you don't understand the upbringing I had. And we have perfected the art of blaming somebody else for where I am. Well, the church doesn't love me enough. He does. Well, pastor doesn't understand. He does. Well, the youth pastor never caught. We have learned to pin so many things on so many people. Why? It's what we learned. The greatest tool the enemy can use against us is to blame somebody else, get bitter, and get offended because when we do that, we block ourselves from the first step. Oh, I, but I can be baptized. I can be, do this. I can do that. I can go. Yes, you can. But the first step, repent. Not the words. You know what repentance is? I messed up. I made some decisions. I, but, 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 but you know what? It's really not your fault. I've had people sit there and tell me, oh, but if you don't understand, you, you have to understand. Don't be too hard on yourself. You don't, I'm not trying to tell you not be, to be harder. I'm trying to say you've got to be honest. I'm, to say, I'm here because I made some decisions that weren't right. There are some things in my life today because I took some turns I should not have taken. I messed up and I repent. What does that mean? Is that just words? No, I repent means I was going this direction and I don't want to go there anymore and so I'm turning and I'm going a different direction. It's not just saying I'm sorry. I talked to someone the other day and they said, oh, you, you, they were about to make this decision that was just is going to hurt so many people I said why are you doing this they said oh I, I know you're not going to like what I'm about to do I'm sorry would you forgive me I said you're not sorry 
How can you tell me I'm not sorry? I said you are apologizing for what you are about to do. You hadn't even done it yet. True sorrow says I don't want to be that anymore. I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to say that anymore. I don't want to go there anymore. Repentance is a turning away. So for those of you that walked in here needing something from God and not sure how to start it, you may be saying, I don't even understand all this stuff. I don't, it's easy. The first thing is say, God, I don't know even what to do, but I know one thing. I don't want to go the direction I'm going anymore. My heart is hungry. I'm, I've got this burden inside. There's some things that are just messed up. This isn't what I wanted my life to be. I don't know how to correct it. But I'm sorry for everything I've done. Would you forgive me quicker than you can say it almost? He, he's not holding nothing against you. But for those of us that have come through that and wondering why we're still where we are. She said, I do, and we got married. But if you think that the first month we got married, that was just the... I thought I knew her before we got married. I'd only ever seen her after her hair was fixed. She'd only ever seen me after, you know, you spend 30 minutes in the mirror, make sure you were as presentable. Afterwards, you see them when they're not in the best of moods. You see them at their worst. You see them at every. What are you saying? I'm saying it's only once you get married that a husband and a wife truly begin to find out who each other is and begin to develop a relationship. Yet some of us, our walk with God stopped getting any deeper the day we received the Holy Ghost. Peter said, repent, be baptized every one of you for the name, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, and that's it. But you go a little bit further than that, and he goes on, he says, save yourselves from this untoward generation. What, what do you mean? I, I just got saved. He said, no, no, you started the relationship right there. But after that, now God's going to open your eyes. And as he does, I, he wants you to increase in faithfulness, to go deeper in prayer than you've ever been before. Pastor, hey, I don't want to be the same person I've been for 20 years. I want my walk with God to go deeper than it's ever been before. I'm not satisfied. I don't know what you're going through. And you can stand with me. I'm closing. Let me tell you something. There is a God that loves you so much. He is stronger than absolutely anything you're fighting right now. And some of you are asking this question, what in the world? What's going on? How come it seems like my life is going here and going there? What, what, what? I would examine myself tonight. What is it I've tied myself to so tightly? Is there something else in my life that takes all my attention and all my affection? Is there something else that is the most important thing to my life? If it's not an altar that I'm tied to, if it's not a walk with God that drives me more than anything else in my life, then it's time to cut some things and say, God, there's only one thing I want directing me. My family's too important to be held and tied to anything else. God, I don't, I'm going to open my hand tonight, and I don't know what you're taking out. But I don't care. I have a hope. The scripture, if you look at it, if you go back to it, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, at the end of that verse, it says, to lay hold upon the hope. He is everything he's ever said he was. But the only way it begins to affect my life is when I lay hold on it. The altar by itself, under you take up this carpet, it's wood. It's wood like any other wood. You could probably match this carpet at a lot of places. And what, what makes the difference at it? What makes it different, it, must, it makes it special, is when I come in this place and I offer him everything I am and I say God I'm not leaving here the way I came I can't afford to go back home the same way I left I can't afford for my family to keep going down the same road it's going and I want you to ask yourself is your walk with God any deeper than it's been all your life or has it just been kind of coasting through it if it is let me tell you that's not the will of God God has so much in store for you. God is wanting to do so much in your life and he's starting to open up your eyes and he's starting to show you things, but it's up to us. I've got an anchor. 
And if I don't get a hold of him, it's not his fault. It's not his fault. And it's not anybody else's. I have an anchor. But I tie the knot. I decide how closely I'm going to get a hold of him or how loosely. God, I don't care what it is. I, God, I don't want anything in my life that's keeping me from you anymore. I don't want anything that's going to, God, I, you don't understand what I'm going through. I can't afford, I can't afford to go back where I came from. Listen, I know you some amazing people, and I don't know where you came from, but I'm telling you right now, I cannot go back to who I used to be. I will lose my marriage. I will lose my children. I will lose my mind. I could even lose my life. I will lose every one of my friends. If I go back to who I used to be, I will lose everything good that has ever happened in my life. I don't know about you, but I can't afford to tie a loose knot. I can't afford to let go of him. I Well, I thought he was holding on to you. He is. Paul said, I count not myself to have apprehended. He said, pressing toward the mark. He said, the God that sought after me, now I'm seeking after him. It's an amazing thing when God reaches down and touches his people. But it doesn't even compare to when he reaches down to someone that's reaching back. I don't know what it is. and I, I've changed so much tonight. And I was like, God, what are, what are we doing? Where, where, where are we going in this? But I believe God's wanting to talk to some people. Some of you walked in here trying to, why in the world am I fighting this? I, I, I thought I'd done everything right. God's saying, I'll, I'll tell you what you're feeling. You're feeling uneasy because God's calling you out to another place. He's saying, come on, you've been here long enough. You got an A, but you know, God, I, I don't want you taking me out there. What if the seas are rocky and look what's going on? It doesn't matter. You got an anchor. What does the song say? Though the ship is battered, the anchor still holds. The sails are torn, but the anchor. Hey, what's going to go on in my family? I've got an anchor. What's going to happen in my life if I really step out and do what God's calling me to do? It's not going to matter. You've got a God that can hold you. You've got a God that will keep you. I promise you he will not fail you. I wonder if there's anybody in this place tonight said, you know what? I don't even know exactly how tight I'm tied to him. I don't really know what my walk with God could even stand. I, I don't really want it to be tried out because I don't know exactly if I really was going through the fight. I'm not exactly sure that my walk with God would carry me through some of the battles that I'm dealing with right now, and that's not okay with me. If that's what you're feeling, let me tell you, why don't you find somewhere around an altar and say, God, I'm not satisfied here. God, I wanna, I'm want i going to be forth faithful like I've never been faithful. I'm starting to pray like I've never prayed. I'm changing some things in my life. It's not okay for me just to go through the motions anymore. God, I, I don't just want a knowledge of you. I need to know you. God, I'm tired of prayer meetings as usual. I'm tired of just coming up and, and just going through the motions. God, I need something to change. So would you search me, God, if there's anything that I'm holding on to that's trying to pull me away from you. Take it, God. And if you walked into this place and you're saying, God, I don't even know who you are. I've heard people talk about you. I've heard people mention what you did for them, but I don't know you. But I know I'm tired, and I know I'm, I know I'm weary. I don't want to be here anymore. God, I don't know if you're real. I don't know what to do. My friend, all you've got to do is begin to open your heart and say, God, I'm crying out to you tonight. Would you search me? Would you let me feel your presence? Would you let me know you're here? I know I've done some things that aren't right. Would you forgive me for everything I've done that's wrong? God, I don't want to carry these things with me anymore. I'm tired. I got some things and some burdens and some regrets, and they weigh me down like you can't imagine. God, I don't want to carry that anymore. Would you forgive me? God, would you fill me with your spirit? I want to feel that peace that they're all talking about. I want to leave here knowing that, God, that you have completely changed my life. Come on, all over this place, can we just begin to reach out to him? I have a hope. I have a hope. I have an anchor. 
I'm not stuck in my situation. I'm not out of options. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how bad it is. I don't care what the enemy's told you. I'm telling you, there is nothing stronger than our God. I'm telling you, you've got someone you can hold on to that can pull you out of every situation, that can pull you through every trial. I'm telling you, we have a hope. Come on, anybody else need one? I know I do. I need one every day of my life. Every morning I wake up, Jesus, I need you today. I need you to keep your hand on my family. God, keep your hand on my marriage. God, keep your hand on my children. Protect my mind, God. Protect me, God. I need you. God, I need to know you like I've never known you before. I need to hear your voice like I've never heard it before. Come on, does anybody else? Does anybody else need him like that? Come on, just cry out to him. 